is the last program of America. It takes a look at America today, or it did, rather, when the program was made, which was in 1972. Now, remember, the aim throughout this series was to show the roots of the present in the past. And that aim is constant through the final program. But some things have changed, gone not quite the way we thought they would. And when I look back at this program, I think that I was unduly grim about some aspects of America and maybe not grim enough about others. For instance, I remarked as if it were a uh, recipe for almost permanent prosperity that America had learned to live by the credit card, by the mortgage, by the bank loan, by Roosevelt's system of deficit financing. Today, whole nations live that way, and the word deficit carries a far more ominous sound than it did. On the other hand, the Black Revolution has achieved less and more than it seemed to promise. Now, you're going to hear the Reverend Jesse Jackson chanting on about total freedom and a separate black political party. Well, that flaming rhetoric cooled, but into action. I would never have dreamed that by today most of the big cities of America would have black mayors. Los Angeles, Chicago, Detroit, Atlanta, Washington. Or that there would be uh, black generals in the armed forces or that my, my bank manager would be a young black woman. You'll notice too that in 1972 there was a great to-do about the communes. Young people who decided not to join or fight the middle class, but to leave it. Well, they've dissolved, and the more serious rebels have gone into local government. Finally, I made the point that in the welfare state, too many of us expect a handout, a government subsidy. Big Daddy will provide. But I didn't think that so soon we would elect a president in protest against this liberal system that we'd come to take for granted. So some points would have been sharpened if I'd been clairvoyant, and some would have been softened. But the main conclusion, the little talk at the end about American society today, what it faces, where it's going, I would not now change a word of it. About a fifth of America, half the West, is semi-desert. For centuries, much of it has been at the mercy of the Colorado River, which is either a trickle that leaves the land parched, or a torrent that floods it with silt. The desert is not infertile. Spit on the desert, they say, out west, and a flower will grow. Here, on the Arizona-Nevada border, is one of the great works of man, Hoover Dam which bottles the 1,400-mile flow of the river and teaches it to spit accurately and often on one quarter million acres of dry land. This reservoir a man-made lake, 110 miles long, holds 5,000 gallons for every man, woman, and child in the world. The dam took 5,000 men 21 months to build. And to get to the bottom of the spillway, you have to go down what would be a 60-story skyscraper. It 
It was built in the Depression in the early 30s, before the age of plastic and lavatory tile. And it used the beautiful, strong materials of the old order, aluminium and steel, copper and brass. They drove tunnels through the canyon bedrock and held the river in them while the spillway was poured. 700 feet high, four and a quarter million cubic yards of concrete. They planted huge icing tubes to hasten its cooling. If it had been left to nature, it would have taken a century to set. I remember the exhilaration with which we first saw the pylons striding across the barren land. To tame the Colorado and make the desert bloom was the stated aim of President Franklin Roosevelt when he dedicated this dam. It was meant to create a huge fruit and vegetable market for America, which it did, and also to produce more electricity, more power to keep Roosevelt's promise of what he called the more abundant life. However, a vast sprouting of power made the desert and much else of America bloom in ways that Roosevelt never had in mind. If it hadn't been for Hoover Dam, this would still be the small, dusty western town where I first bedded down in a rooming house with cockroaches the size of turtles. But it's now Las Vegas, the archetype of the new pleasure cities of America, which offer screaming solicitations to people passing through to stop and stay and enjoy themselves. Before the sun goes down, it pierces the eyeballs as cruelly as Broadway by daylight. But when the twilight comes on, it settles into a large shape and a sharp style that is nowhere but America in the 1970s. A single downtown hotel consumes as much electricity as the houses in a town of 60,000. It takes this kind of candle power to create the nighttime image of Babylon in the desert. But mind, it is every man's cut rate Babylon. Not far from here, there's a, a roadside lunch counter, and over it is a sign which proclaims in three words that the Roman emperor's orgy is now a democratic institution. It says, topless pizza lunch. And in the pleasure dome of Las Vegas, people line up for hours to register into motels and indulge the pleasures that were once reserved at Baden-Baden for Edward VII and King Farouk. The stakes can be as high or as low as you like. It's the big time on a low budget, which you must admit exhibits neither the formal gloom nor the listless trance of casinos for the rich. Nevertheless, it would be the understatement of the century to say that this was not what Franklin Roosevelt meant by the more abundant life. And yet it was made directly possible by harnessing the power of the Colorado River through the generators at Hoover Dam. Las Vegas in the 1970s is only one example we're going to look at of a revolution in American values, of the starkest historical contrast between the old American dream 
and the new American reality. Certainly this is maybe a civilization and a decadence away from that new world for which the Pilgrim Fathers, after their first harvest, rose and gave thanks. Give us this day the courage which our forefathers had on this first Thanksgiving Day 350 years ago. Since the original Puritans, conceptions of purity have come a long way. And this group in California is only one of legions of permissive cults with their own views of community, of religion, of therapy. America was settled by tough, patient people carrying a few rude staples. Today, food groans and gurgles from coast to coast in variations both succulent and frivolous. America used to be the land of boundless spaces. Today, boundless space is available only to the airbound reporter instructing the earthbound midgets. America reveled at the beginning of the century in the latest ingenuity of the glorious industrial revolution. Today, we have reaped that whirlwind. America was the magic word and the better life for millions of Europeans penned in ghettos. Today, the magic has faded, but the tenements remain. These contrasts are obviously worldwide, but they always seem more depressing and dramatic here because America didn't inherit a nation, it invented one and boasted that it would be better than everything that had gone before. Europeans especially take delight in saying, you see, uh, life over there for all its well-advertised equality is just as unequal as ours. Well, it isn't. Morally, of course, the Americans know as much as any of us about the seven deadly sins. And because they expected more, they know more about disillusion. But materially, what was new about the American experiment was the attempt to deny special privilege, to bring well-being to the masses. Thirty years ago, a presidential candidate, Wendell Wilkie, said it in a sentence. The American economy cannot exist unless Americans regard as necessities what other people look on as luxuries. Now, this impulse was at work very early. Take as a dramatic example the son of George Washington's judge advocate general, an upper crust Bostonian, the very last type that you would expect to become the first tycoon and the founding father of anything so democratic as an ice cream parlor. What's your life? I'll have bubblegum ice cream and burgundy sherry. Corn? Yeah. Banana split? Corn. Corn. Okay. I'll have a cone with a scoop of mandarin chocolate sherbet and a scoop of peach chiffon. Um, peppermint, peppermint fudge with a chocolate fudge with nuts. And um, my toppings, I think I'd like chocolate and mushroom. Right. Right. The man who made this possible was a man named Frederick Tudor. And without his kind, Americans would not have had ice boxes in their homes a century before Europeans had refrigerators and ice cream might today be a luxury as exotic as Iranian caviar. Now, Tudor, mind you, was born in 1784. His three brothers went to Harvard, but he wanted to be up and doing, and he quit school at 13, became a merchant, and an inventor with so many mad ideas which didn't pay off, that a whimsical brother said, I wonder that you don't break up the ice on the Boston ponds and ship it to the tropics. Well, young Tudor, ignored the crack and seized on the brainwave and he shipped 130 tons of ice to Martinique. It melted in six weeks. Insulation was the big problem. And like Edison with his filament, he tried everything from straw to blankets and he beat it in the end with sawdust. 
And then, to get uniform blocks of ice, he got a friend to design an ice cutter with two parallel runners made of iron with saw teeth, and they were pulled across the ponds by uh, horses. Within 15 years, he collared title to the New England ponds, got monopoly rights on building ice houses in Havana and uh, New Orleans and Charleston, and with his own fleet was shipping ice in thousands of tons to the West Indies, to Persia, to India, and to Europe. Now, the foreigners were delighted with the product, but uh, like an Englishman contemplating his first corn on the cob, they wondered what to do with it. But Tudor knew that the golden rule of merchandising is to create an appetite for something that you didn't even know you wanted. He undercut his competitors. He offered bargains in bulk, and in the end, he delivered his ice at a penny a pound. Frederick Tudor made ice a necessity, even at the end of the Second World War in England. No question, the middle class in America does have it better than most other nations. The conversion of luxuries into necessities goes on. Row houses in the new suburbs have little swimming pools to mimic the status pools of the rich. But to maintain this setup, to keep up with the Joneses, the American family has taken over the policy the Roosevelt government adopted in the Depression. Deficit financing. Without the credit card and the mortgage and the bank loan, I doubt the affluent society could exist. Since the last war, the crumbling centers of the cities have been replaced by skyscraper office buildings and banks and loan and insurance buildings, not by housing. The central land is now too dear for housing, so the old city types have departed for the country and the new suburbs. After every war, there's always a massive movement of population, and after the last one, the young men who fought in the Pacific spread the word that California was the place where there were no slums, where the valleys were fruitful and the living was easy. There was a song that celebrated this dream. Oh, I'm packing my grip And I'm leaving today Cause I'm taking a trip California way I'm gonna settle down and never more roll And make the San Fernando Valley my home I'll forget my sins I'll be making new friends The San Fernando Valley, when I first knew it, was almost a relic of New Spain with tiled houses, barns, corrals and platoons of eucalyptus trees marching through an horizon of green pastures. The song was irresistible. Its invitation has since been accepted by one and a half million people. I'm gonna settle down and never more and make the San Fernando Valley my home And make the San Fernando Valley my home What has made a thousand green valleys into a thousand choking suburbs? The automobile, the motor car and the installment plan and their showroom, the second-hand car lot with more pennants flying than they had at Agincourt have stripped the approach into the cities of their original identity and regional character. Where is this? It might be Gary, Indiana, Cleveland, Miami, Phoenix, but the glimpse of a eucalyptus tree and a stray palm tells us it is Los Angeles, the city of the angels, where one quarter of the city's land area is monopolized by the motor car and its needs. Freeways, highways, garages, petrol stations, parking lots, car lots. The motor car has given every man a marvelous mobility. It's also done something that Henry Ford never figured on. It has covered the cities of the world with a suffocating blanket of anonymity. Anonymity and foul air. 
what to do about it. Well, there are always the alert watchdogs of the Congressional Investigating Committees, which have the power to subpoena practically anybody but the President, and to make even giant corporations apologize. To the extent that General Motors bears responsibility, I want to apologize here and now to the members of this subcommittee and Mr. Nader. And to hear the complaints of any citizen with a plausible case. The making of the Corvair provides a spacious and instructive case study of the subordination of safety considerations to the tyranny of the cost accountants and the creative lethality of the stylus. But frequently, these committees take down millions of words that are never acted on. And Washington can be a long way from the pollution in your own backyard. So there is the sturdy figure of the do-it-yourself watchdog. Ellen Harris, how are you? Well, I just came from walking along the beach today, down at um, the point where the Hyperion sewage plant is, and the Edison power plant, and the standard refinery. And there were a couple of tankers offshore. The stench was overwhelming, and the surf was dark gray to black. She is Mrs. Ellen Harris, and she sits in her bedroom here in Los Angeles, a one-woman telephone terror of the city fathers what is causing the trouble, but the stench uh, seemed uh, to be something, you know, quite overpowering, and I, I don't know if that's a question for the air pollution control people to concern themselves. She's fought smog density, airport decibels, sewage disposal, all the things that now disfigure the once beautiful beaches of California. But despite these hazards, the young continue to frolic in the oily, stinking foam. And lately, the cities have been forced to appoint official watchdogs, some of whom are bred in unlikely cradles. They're about to pick Miss America of 1945, and Miss New York looks like the winner. Venus Ramey, the winner last year, places her regal robes on the shoulders of Bess Meyerson of the Bronx, the first New York gal ever to become the reigning queen of beauty. And here she is, crowned Miss America of 1945. And certainly the only Miss America to become New York City's official prosecutor of grocers with a thumb on the scale. The policewoman of the supermarket that separates the product from its price tag. Well, if you put them together with the largest sizes, then the customer would know which is the best buy. That's right. And that is the reason for your pricing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this. There's the large. And then you have the next one. Right. And then you have the next one and the next one. And you have the different prices along under here. And then she reads it along and she sees how much it is per quart. These consumer protectors also go after quack medicines, loan sharks, butchers and landlords who gouge the blacks. Such volunteer vigilantes are in the great American tradition of muckraking journalists. However, in the past 20 years, many millions of city dwellers have abandoned the city and its afflictions altogether and gone to new suburbs in open country. But they too can take on the city's monotonous order and copy its random violence and high school drugs and assembly line food. All of which has led a generation of the idealistic young to reject the city and the suburb and the whole caboodle of values of what they call Middle America. They've retreated into deeper country to do what the first Puritans did to build their own house, start their own society from the ground up, as here in New Hampshire. Pay no more. No more to pay the bugs, it looks like. Oh, there's tons of them. Yeah. <laughs> they kill the insects by hand because they're against pesticides. They grow their own food, do their own curing, baking, churning, mending, all the chores of a rural, self-sufficient society. That's what they're after self-sufficiency with pride. These are not whimsical or hooligan dropouts. They're all university graduates, some of them old political protesters who three years ago decided not to fight the system, but to leave it. But not to scorn its country cousins. 
They help the locals cut hay, they buy their grain in bulk from a cooperative. They share all the tasks, taking it in turns to mind the children, and coming all together only at the evening meal. Jesus. <laughs> Let's hold hands and be quiet. Calm down, little brother. Time heals all wounds. No matter how much one is weeping, the moon always follows the sun. Eat your bananas and fresh leaves, and don't cry anymore. Because forever and ever, the moon will follow the sun. We thank thee, Lord, for happy hearts, for rain and sunny weather. We thank thee, Lord, for this our food, and that we are together. Amen. 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 We got granola and fried onions with soy grits and meat dish and carrot dish. Uh, I'll serve you uh, We don't need this top. Uh, anyway. They've been here three summers. It remains to see in the next generation how deep is this split with the huge middle class to which most of the time most Americans have aspired. Well, communes come in many shapes and styles. California, especially, has long been the spiritual home of imported religions from yogi to instant serenity and health cults from yogurt to high colonic irrigation. But quite simply, this is a party thrown by a wealthy young man who lives alone in a cliff-top pavilion above Los Angeles. They have one common obsession. These exotic goings-on are dedicated solely to the pursuit of vegetarianism, both human and animal. But this too is nothing new. The idea of a community of purists or malcontents in retreat is almost as old as the Republic, which was, after all, founded by malcontents. The classic model of the commune was one created here in Indiana on the banks of the Wabash in 1825 by Robert Owen, a Welshman, a prosperous self-made mill owner who first reformed his own factories and then headed for America to start an empire of good sense here in New Harmony. He bought up the dormitories of a failed religious colony and brought in intellectuals, Swiss educators, scientists, 900 eager disciples. Owen's principles were majestic. Total equality of the sexes, property to be held in common, absolute freedom of action for the individual. I'm afraid that the leaders had in common that strain not only of arrogance, but of asininity that runs through the most earnest idealists. Children, for instance. Children were to have a special place in society. They were to be the tender, privileged guests. Too often they turned out to be just children. <laughs> Owen called his experiment an empire of good sense. Though that was the last thing that seemed to rule them. Equality of labor was another thing. Everybody to do the humblest chores, whether able or not. Owen offered and started to do the baking and was employed to desist only when general indigestion set in. 
And like many another passionate advocate of equal rights, he laid down the rules. It was too much for most people. Freedom meant the freedom to be a wealthy hanger-on or a poor incompetent. The farmers complained that the musicians got equal wages for just fiddling around. Some man coveted another man's wife. Some woman had an awful laugh. In a word, these dedicated purists made the maddening discovery that they had more than a taint of human nature. They found that living with nine people, let alone 900, could be more of a strain than living with a million. And within five years, the empire of good sense dissolved. It left behind a band of scholars and the germ of some excellent social reforms and a few sturdy physical relics, including every spring, a perennial reminder of the first high hopes in the blossom of the golden rain tree, which was imported from China by Owen's best friend and his partner in the original deal. But these are minority protests, whether wise or freakish. The unrepentant majority has other solutions, and if they have the money, they can now create this, an artificial island on an artificial lake. Its own schools, churches, golf course, boat dock, fishing, riding stables, a bucolic retreat for the comfortable. But well aware of the hostile world outside, Whereas in the city fortresses of the well-to-do, closed-circuit television keeps watch in lifts and garages. In the country, the lake is a kind of moat. Guests are screened. The resident can drive out, but the stranger cannot drive in. So, first the suburb was a refuge from the city's noise, its lack of greenery, then from its density and smog, and now from its crime, and more often than the refugees admit from them. Who are they? They are the ever-growing and derelict population of the city's blacks. The question of what to do with the blacks is one of the oldest and guiltiest of America's problems. The fifth president, James Monroe, thought the blacks could have no happy future in the land they'd been sold to. He gave his blessing and his name, to the capital of Liberia, Monrovia, founded in Africa by high-minded whites as a haven for ex-slaves. It was never a realistic solution. Black labor was too precious to export. And in the intervening century, Abraham Lincoln spoke for his fellows when he said, neither my own feelings nor those of the mass of whites will admit of making them social and political equals. The only preventive of amalgamation is a separation of the races. And the word separation became a talisman. And in the 1890s, the Supreme Court settled everything once for all by granting the blacks separate but equal rights. The snag was they were very rarely equal. Sixty years later, a black parent in Kansas legally protested against separate schools and the Supreme Court reversed itself and sparked the black revolution of our day. Integration was the order of the court and it was to be obeyed with all deliberate speed. The exulting blacks never guessed that speed could be so deliberate. So they began their own mass protest, at first with laborious marches in the company of white sympathizers. The southern courts wriggled through the loophole of state constitutions and delayed and evaded. We'd all assume trouble in the south, and that's where the first sporadic violence came. But we never guessed at the tenacious resistance of the whites in the northern cities. You are ordered to stop, stand where you are. This march will not continue. Yeah. Uh -huh.
word confrontation emerged from the dictionary with a new and frightful meaning in Watts, Detroit, Newark, Baltimore, Washington. Today on the black campuses, there are blacks learning professions and businesses that they'll practice in the white world. Blacks who want no part of the white world, who want even separate states, and blacks who want and feel everything in between. Now, in the Western experience, black has been a negative. And that goes all the way to the heart of the Christian experience, literally. Garvey said, and was one of the promoters of the idea that black is beautiful. That black uh, was a plus rather than a minus. And that uh, all groups should define themselves by their most common characteristic. And if in our case that characteristic is color, then that color should be a positive point of departure. For the first time, the black population of America, the submerged one-ninth, has developed a philosophy and acted on it, and looked up to national leaders who are all the more poignant that some of them turned so soon into martyrs. There's no such thing as freedom in this country for a black man. There's no such thing as justice in this country for a black man. And there's no such thing as equality in this country for a black man. This is our white man's country. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And in 1972, there was held the first holy black political convention. In the name of Matt Turner, Soldier in the Truth, Mary McLeod Bethune, Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, Martin King, what time is it? When we come together, what time is it? When we respect each other, what time is it? When we get our self-confidence, what time is it? When we form our own political party, what time is it? The idea of revolutionary violence, uh, which goes back in the black experience as one of the under themes for a long, long time, goes back to the 1820s, David Walker, uh, his appeal to the slaves, where he said simply, that since slavery is maintained by violence, it can only be uh, destroyed through violence. But uh, I suspect that as a practical recommendation in terms of operating theory, revolutionary violence is a minor theory, although a major whoosh. And I think there's a distinction. Well, speaking for myself, I believe that Monroe's solution shipping Negroes back to Africa to form their own nations, might have been wise in 1820, but it's a century and a half too late. I don't know what the realistic solution is. I do know, and there are many disenchanting episodes in American history to prove it, that nothing is more mischievous to good government than splendid rhetoric that doesn't pay off. Now look what's being asked. The rehousing of a population, the chance of free education through college, the strangling of the drug traffic at the roots, and the radical overhauling of the prisons, the jury system, the courts. Now, this is going to call for 
prodigies of goodwill, but also for a massive subsidy of taxes, white taxes, beyond our experience. As an historian, I'm not sure that an integrated society will work. As an old reporter, I suspect that the blacks will not get more than Lincoln's massive whites who live here in the ratio of nine to one is willing to give them. The best hope, I think the only sensible hope, is that the mass of whites have greatly changed since Lincoln's day, or will change, so that the blacks, whether inside or outside white society, can become an equal race, separately respected. It's no accident, I think, that this is the great age of tourism. It's why the airplane is our Santa Maria. For all of us, white, black, city, suburb, want an out. The airlines strive to offer Shangri-La at bargain basement prices. Good evening. Uh, I have a reservation on flight 111. Last name, please. The name is Cook, C-O-O-K-E. When the American colonies were beginning to revolt against British rule, many European philosophers felt that their society too was threatened with tragic failure. They dreamed of a pure society on some remote island inhabited exclusively by noble savages. And a Frenchman went to look for it. He and his crew went beyond America into the farthest ocean, and we are following them. For, like them and the Spaniards we laughed at 13 hours ago, most of us believe that westward the land is brighter. In the winter that George Washington and his ragged army were fighting to survive at Valley Forge, the first white man stepped on this shore and was greeted by the natives as one of their four gods come back to earth. The tourist literature hopes that you too will feel like Captain Cook. famous memento of that Frenchman's heaven on earth, the Bougainvillea. And inevitably, the dreamy bonus of beautiful plant maidens. <laughs> this is Hawaii. This is Hawaii, the 50th state, already far gone with our troubles, traffic, pollution. Urban sprawl and suburban density and the new fear of one's neighbor. Are these people then in the same stew as the rest of us? Well, at first glance, it seems a happier stew, a more permanent melting pot than we have on the mainland. Maybe this is the ultimate hope, the next stage in the human family. For the Polynesians have intermarried with most other strains. 
and there are around you, it appears, more relaxed blacks. And here the issue of a Chinese father and an Irish mother, of a Filipino and a Scot, of a white American and a Japanese. There is a price to pay. Hawaiians had a strong original culture with its own way of life. One element that survives is an Hawaiian invention, the mastery of the sea on surfboards. their culture have been dissolved and diluted and bottled for the tourists who have invaded the islands in increasing hordes to feel carefree and safe in the playground of the 50th state. All the same, you can't call it a triumph for democracy when Americans feel, as so many do, that the only safe place is at home in a room of one's own, like this. A wise historian usually stops 20 or 30 years before his own time because, like the rest of us, he can't see the wood for the trees. But I have tried in this program to say something about American civilization today because what is fiercely in dispute between the communist and the non-communist nations is the quality and staying power of American civilization. Every other country scorns American materialism while striving to match it. Envy obviously has something to do with it, but there is a true basis for this debate. And it is whether America is in its ascendant or its decline. I myself think I recognize several of the symptoms that Edward Gibbon saw so acutely in the decline of Rome, which arise not from external enemies, but from inside the country itself. A love of show and luxury, a widening gap between the very rich and the very poor. The exercise of military might in places remote from the centers of power, an obsession with sex, freakishness in the arts masquerading as originality and enthusiasm pretending to creativeness and a general desire to live off the state whether it's a junkie on welfare or a government subsidized airline in a word the idea that Washington Big Daddy will provide yet I have tried to show that the original institutions of this country still have great vitality much of the turmoil here springs from the energy of people who are trying to apply those institutions to forgotten minorities. Now, as for our rage to believe that we've found the secret of liberty in general permissiveness from the cradle on, I can only recall the saying of a wise Frenchman, liberty is the luxury of self-discipline. And historically, those people's that did not discipline themselves had it thrust on them from the outside. That's why the usual cycle of great nations has been first a powerful tyranny broken by revolt, the introduction of liberty, the abuse of liberty, and back to tyranny again. As I see it in this country, a land of the most persistent idealism and blandest cynicism, the race is on between its decadence and its vitality. Now, as for the woes that we share with the world that you can see from your window, the overpopulation, 
the pollution of the atmosphere, the cities and the rivers, the destruction of nature. I find it impossible to believe that a nation which produced such ingenious human beings as Jefferson and uh, Eli Whitney, John Deere, McCormick, Kettering, Oppenheimer, Edison, Benjamin Franklin, is going to sit back and let the worst happen. There is now a real possibility that atomic energy can help us to cure incurable diseases and preserve our food indefinitely and through breeder reactors which renew more power than they spend actually clean the cities and the oceans and that would take us over a watershed that none of us has conceived but to get back to this country and looking back over the 200 years of its life as an independent republic the oldest surviving republic by the way two sentences have kept coming back to me on the road and I want to leave you with them. One of them is from a very distinguished judge, and the other is from a very obscure immigrant. The first reminds us that a constitution is made to be argued about, not to impose a single doctrinaire view of life. It's a tremendous sentence from Mr. Justice Holmes. A constitution is made for people of fundamentally differing opinions. And the other is the remark of an old Italian immigrant who for many years had a shoeshine box outside Grand Central Station in New York. And he said something forgotten many times, forgotten, I think, by the founding fathers in the ecstasy of their promising everybody life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When this old man was asked, what 40 years of life in America had taught him, he said, there is no free lunch. Oh, <laughs> 